Hey Declaration Church, super excited to be back in our study through Acts. And so if you've got your Bibles, your devices, turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Uh, this past week I was talking with one of my kids and I'd said, hey man, I need you to uh, pick up your, your dirty laundry, pick up that dirty towel that you had just used uh, in, in the bath, in the shower, and, and go put all that stuff away. And then I kind of walked off and, and was doing some other things in the house and came back and I still saw the dirty clothes and the, the laundry right there where they were. And so I just looked at my son and I was like, hey, uh, what's going on? Like, I, I told you to do this. Like, did you think I was just telling you that so I could hear myself talk? Like, uh, w w what was going on? And he was like, oh, I I I'm sorry. Like, I didn't know you wanted me to do it right now. And I was like, yeah, like delayed obedience is disobedience. Yes, I want you to do it right now, not not wait. This is this isn't like uh, a suggestion. Like, hey, if you want to do this, uh, do it. But it, it's actually a command, and I, and I want you to obey me uh, the first time that I say something. And and so I think that's a similar circumstance for any parent uh, of children. That man, we 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 give a command. We say, hey, I need you to do this. I want you to do this. This is not a suggestion. It's actually a command. Uh, every parent struggle with that. And if we look through the scriptures, we see that God the Father struggles with that. That same thing, that He gives us commands for us to obey, for His people, for His church to obey. And sometimes we just don't. We, we see those commands as suggestions rather than commandments of God that need to be obeyed. And we see these uh, really clearly with the mission of God. That over and over and over throughout the scriptures, we see God say, Hey, go and make disciples, Matthew 28. Uh, 18 through 20. We see it again in Acts chapter 1-8 when he says this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I'm giving you this power, not just so you can sit on it, but that you might go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And he's given us that same power with the Holy Spirit. We, we, we see that in Acts chapter 2, and we see it over and over, not just in the Gospels, but even again in Acts, as he told Paul, uh, Jesus said that Paul would be a chosen instrument for of his so that he would carry his name, the name of Jesus, to Gentiles and to kings and, and to other people. And we have been chosen by God, been saved, not so that we just sit on our salvation, but we've been redeemed to redeem. Uh, we see it again in Acts 40, uh, 10, 42, what we talked about last week, where Peter says, God has commanded us to preach the gospel and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And so here's my question. If we've been commanded by God, to go and share the gospel, to share our faith, why are we not doing it? What's, where's the breakdown? And I think for many of us, we, we would acknowledge that breakdown and be like, man, I, I, I go to church or I give faithfully or I serve in these ways. But for many of us, sharing our faith and sharing the gospel, uh, making disciples of all nations or even of our neighborhood, is difficult for us. Uh, matter of fact, Barna uh, is a, uh, a research company, and you can go online and, and look at all their statistics and do a deep dive. Matter, matter of fact, it, it is a deep dive. Like you can get real deep in a lot of their statistics, but they say that this 64% of Christians today say that every Christian has a responsibility to share their faith with others. Well, only 64%. So only 64 of our church would say, yeah, yeah, it's our responsibility to share their faith. Now, what's fascinating about that is 25 years ago, 89% of Christians would say it is our personal responsibility to share our faith. So the question remains, how many actually do? Well, Barna would also say in their statistics and their research that only 19% of Christians say that they proactively look for or try to create opportunities to share their faith with non-Christians. Only 19%. And that still leaves us hanging going, okay, that's 19% that are trying to do it, trying, literally sitting there while their hair's getting cut or their nails are being done or whatever, and going, how could I connect this conversation to spiritual matters or to faith or to Jesus? That, that's 19% that are trying to think through it. And so I would think that the ones that are actually doing it are actually less than 19%. And 
And so why so few? Now, there's a lot of different things. Maybe some of you are going, man, I don't know how to share my faith, or I've never experienced that. I've never done that. Or maybe you're just like, hey, maybe you're part of that percentage that goes, I didn't even know it was my job. I thought that's what we paid you to do, Pastor Blake. I thought that was your role, your job, not mine. And so maybe we just see the scriptures and it's a discipleship issue that now you're going, hey, it is my job. God has placed me in this, in this neighborhood, in this uh, occupation, with these friends, in these circles of influence, that it's my job to share my faith with people, with my friends, with my family, with my coworkers, with my neighbors. But if we get down to it, a lot of us don't share our faith because we're, we're afraid of rejection. We're, we're afraid of some type of rejection that we might receive. Uh, but the truth is, there will be somebody that, that will reject your faith. There will be somebody that will reject the gospel uh, as it's shown to you. But here's the beautiful truth, is that even though some will reject, the truth is some will receive. Yes, some actually will receive the gospel. Some will believe and receive. And so what do we do with both of these groups? You see, this is not a, a problem that we face today in the year 2020 only, alone. This is not isolated today. Matter of fact, we see the Apostle Paul and Barnabas in the church in the New Testament in Acts facing this same dilemma. What do we do with those who receive the gospel and what do we do with those who reject the gospel? And we see that here really clearly in Acts 13. So let, let's go there. Verse 1 says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called uh, Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, now uh, what I want to show you here in, in this little in this first little, little part, is that there is a diversity of gifts and of goers. All right? Right here, we get a diversity of gifts in the sense that it says, hey, there were prophets and there were teachers. If we look in Hebrews, I mean, excuse me, if we look in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, it begins to go, hey, these are the gifts that we need to make disciples. And prophets and teachers are two of the five. We also see shepherds. Uh, we also see pastors. We also see evangelists. But we see prophets and teachers maybe were more prominent in the church at Antioch. Uh, and this is a beautiful picture because we need a diversity of gifts. Much like our Aggie football team here, we need an offensive line, but we don't need everybody on the Aggie football team weighing 330 pounds. We need some shifty dudes. We need some guys that have some speed that can run a sub 4 five forty. We need some guys that can throw. We need some guys that can catch. We need some guys that can uh, hit that hole and juke people out. We need a diversity of gifts on our Aggie football team for us to be successful in the same way we need a diversity of gifts within the church. But we don't only see a diversity of gifts, we see a diversity of goers. We see a diversity of backgrounds. Notice here that he says th th there's uh, um, Barnabas who was from Cyrene. We see earlier in Acts chapter 4, he was a Levite from Cyprus. We see Simeon, who was probably from Africa. We see Lucius from Cyrene. We see uh, Manian, who was a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch. He was probably very influential, maybe even wealthy. Uh, we see all of these people. and We see Saul, who was a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he would call himself. And so there's a diverse background of people that are taking the gospel forward. This is what we need in our church. This is what we need in every church. We need a diversity, not just of gifts that God has given us through His Holy Spirit, but we need a diversity of goers as well. Those who are going to take the gospel out. Because the truth be known, I can reach some people that maybe you can't reach. And there on the other side, there are some certain people that you can reach with the gospel that you just naturally connect with, that you have an affinity with, that maybe I can't. There, there are certain people that for whatever reason, the way that God has designed me and wired me, that it, we just don't make that connection. 
but because you live by them and your kids play the same sports as them and maybe you, you're in the same occupation as them or you have the same affinity for things that maybe you would connect or maybe even the same racial background or socioeconomic background that maybe would enable you to connect with them for the sake of the gospel more than I could. And so this is why we need a diversity of gifts and a diversity of backgrounds. But that's not all we need. Check it out. Look in verse 2 and 3. It says this. It says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. You know what's beautiful about this is it shows that the, the Holy Spirit sent them and the church supported them. Listen, if we're going to be on mission with God, if we're going to lead people to Christ, we have to be sent by the Holy Spirit. We have to be sent by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's not in it, then it's not going to happen. We, we talk about this all the time at, as our staff, and we say, hey, listen, uh, let's pray for God to move, because it doesn't matter how hard we preach, or how good our worship team is, or how good our kids' ministry is, or how good our youth ministry is, or whatever. It does not matter if the Spirit of God is not transforming the hearts and lives of people. And so we need the Spirit. We need to be empowered by the Spirit. But what we also need is the church being supportive and coming together and going, hey, I got you. I got your back. You're going to teach. I'm going to shepherd. You're going to preach. I'm going to love. I'm going to care. Uh, you're going to serve. I'm going to fund the mission. We need all of the gifts working together, all of the church. Now, let's see how this happened. Because as we know, just because we have the Holy Spirit empowering us and sending us and a great church supporting us, we have a diversity of gifts and a diversity of background doesn't mean everything's going to go according to plan. That doesn't mean everyone's going to receive the gospel. And we'll see that really clearly here. Look in verse 4. It says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Patmos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul, and he sought to hear the word of God. But Elimaeus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now listen, he, right here, right off the bat, you have Saul, one of the greatest missionaries ever known to the church, who's been sent by the Holy Spirit, supported by the church, who knows the scriptures inside and out, and already he's got one guy that's eager to hear the scriptures, wants to know God, wants to know the word of God. And he's got one guy that's avidly opposing his work, outright opposing the word of God, the work of God, to the point that he's trying to get his friend away from Paul. And so I just say this for us. It's a good reminder to go, hey, this is common. This is common that even in the scriptures, even with the greatest missionary the world's ever seen in the Apostle Paul, we see an opposition to our work. And so we shouldn't be surprised by this. We shouldn't be surprised that there's opposition. If we look back in the scriptures in Matthew uh, 10 and so many others, we see even Jesus being opposed. And so to take the weight off of us as believers, as people who are trying to share our faith, if the Apostle Paul was opposed, and if even Jesus was opposed as he shared the good news about himself and his kingdom, then surely we'll be opposed too. And so don't receive that as rejection, like a personal rejection of you. It, it's what Jesus received. The, the scriptures in Isaiah would even say that Jesus was despised and rejected by men. And so they're not necessarily rejecting you, they're rejecting your Savior. And at the end of the day, that should cause pity in us. We, we should pity those people that reject Jesus, but not see that, receive it as a personal rejection and affront. Now, what does Paul do? How does he respond to this rejection? Uh, check it out. He says, uh, Paul... Uh, 
or Saul, verse 9, Saul, who was also called Paul, there's a shift in his name right there, but who was filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him. Now, this is crazy, right? I mean, Paul just gave a word of judgment. Now, if we're honest, we don't do that very often. I don't hear about those words, strong words of judgment very often in the church. And you may even be even listening to this going, man, that doesn't sound like Jesus. Je- Jesus would never give that strong word of judgment. And honestly, we don't see that much in evangelicalism today. But if we're real honest and we've, we really study the scriptures, we actually do see Jesus give strong words. We saw Jesus give incredibly strong words uh, to to the Pharisees. You brood of vipers, he called them. We see Jesus give strong words of judgment even to his disciples in Matthew 16 when he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. He's calling the same thing that Paul is calling this guy here. That's a strong word of judgment. And for so many of us, we're scared to give that strong word of judgment to anybody who would pose the gospel. Maybe because we're afraid that we'll turn them off to the gospel. Well, let's be real honest. This dude's already turned off to the gospel as it is. He couldn't be more turned off to the gospel. As a matter of fact, he's so turned off to the gospel, he's trying to turn someone who's open to the gospel off to the gospel. And so this is why Paul gives this strong word. And Paul's not wrong in this. Matter of fact, if you look back at the word uh, in verse 9, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus. Just like Jesus did when he uh, called out the Pharisees or called out Pilate or called out Caiaphas or any of those people that he confronted with truth. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he did it filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is a good word for you guys that are prophets and maybe speak the word really boldly. And sometimes you cross that line into ungodliness that you don't give a gentle answer or you don't give a godly answer. Are we doing that because we're filled with the Holy Spirit? Are we doing it because we're filled with flesh? That's a great word. But here we see this guy openly opposing and rejecting the gospel. But that's not the end of the story. Look in verse 12. It says, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. This is a beautiful lesson for us because here is someone who's an intelligent man, a, an influential man, a wealthy man who is, has a friend or somebody near him that's actively opposing the work of God, and yet he's astonished at the word of God. Church, this is a great word for us because the Word of God is powerful. Amen? The Word of God, matter of fact, Hebrews 4.12 would say this, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the point of division of soul and spirit. It's a discerner of thoughts and intentions of our heart. Do we believe that the Word of God is, is not just powerful, but able to give life? Uh, I, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 119, and it's a big one. But it, right there in the middle, Psalm 119, 25 says, the, the psalmist says, Give me life according to your word. Do we believe that the word of God will give us life? You see, we have to go back to Genesis 2 when he created man. And the word of God says he breathed life into us and we became living beings. Now, that's a physical way that the Word of God breathed life, but there's also a spiritual way that God's Word breathed life into humanity. That's why, uh, again, Paul would say later in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. My, my question to you is this. Do you believe the Word of God is living and active and able to give life? That's what the Word of God claims that it is. Matter of fact, Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that it goes forth from my mouth. This is God saying this, that it will not return to me empty or void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and please and shall succeed in the thing for which I, I sent it. Do we believe that God's Word will not go out void? And so if you share your go- the gospel and you use the Word of God with your neighbor, 
with the person that's cutting your hair or doing your nails or whatever might be, that that word doesn't just go out void, doesn't just fall to the ground empty, but it's powerful. It's able to give life. You see, when we believe that, all of a sudden we're going to start not just sharing our testimony, not just telling people about Jesus, but actually giving them the word of life, the living and active word of life that is able to transform and save their souls. We've got to believe that. But, but I think it begins with us as believers, as Christians, being astonished with the word itself. I love that phrase that it says about Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, that he was astonished at the word of God. Christian, how long has it been since you've been astonished at the Word of God? How long has it been since you you read the Word and you were just like, wow, this is living, this is active, it speaks to my soul, it gives life to me, it strengthens me. I'd, I'd encourage you, if it's been a while, read through Psalm 119 this week. Let those words uh, profoundly transform your heart. It's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. But I think, listen... If we're not astonished at God's Word, then we're not going to share God's Word. And which means uh, lost people are not going to have a chance to accept and receive and believe God's Word in and of itself. Listen, the truth is, some will receive the Word of God. This is what He's doing. The Kingdom of God is forcefully advancing, as Jesus says in Matthew 11. Uh, but But we've got to be willing to share it so that others can be saved by it. Yes. All right, let's keep going uh, ver- there in verse 13. Uh, I want to show you some other examples. It says, Now Paul and his companion set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, Pamphylia, and John left them. He returned to Jerusalem. We'll see him circle back in John 15. Uh, but they went on from Perga and came down to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. And after reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to him and said, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement uh, for the people, would you say it? And so Paul stood up and motioned with his hand, and literally for the next 30 minutes, or 30, excuse me, 30 verses, he gave him a word. He's like, no, I ain't got one word. I got a, a lot of words to share. And we see Paul share the gospel there in the synagogue. Paul would always go to the synagogue. He would always go to the Jews. Maybe it was because there was low-hanging fruit because they already understood the law and he just kind of had to connect the dots for them. Uh, But he would always go there and, and do this. But listen, even in the midst of this phenomenal sermon that he gives in the rest of Acts 13, there's still some that 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 respond in different ways. We see a radical response from the people who heard. Check it out. Let's fast forward uh, on to verse 42. It says, And they went out, and the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. These people are begging, Hey, would you come back? Would you come back and meet with me? Would you come back and talk to me? Uh, I heard this past week one of our young men in our church uh, has just begun to uh, grow a relationship with one of his co-workers. And he, he brought him to church and has just been kind of loving on him. And he, he, he did some benevolence work and kind of helped him out in some ways. And, and after bringing him to church a time or two, the young man said, Hey, hey, would you read the Bible with me? And he was like, Absolutely. Here's a young man in our day and age, a a young man who's in college that's going, man, would you please read the Scripture? Like, I have a desire in my heart to read the Scriptures and to know God. Listen, if that's not a work of the Spirit, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. And so here we see these people begging for more teaching, for more truth. For, for more of, of God. Verse 43, And after, meeting, uh, after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, they urged them co- to continue in the grace of God. And so here right off the bat, they're, they're teaching, they're, they're sharing the gospel, and people are following and believing. That You see people receiving the gospel. Listen, Maybe if we just believe the scriptures that the word of God is actually powerful and that when we actually send it out, it doesn't return void, but it actually plants seeds. Maybe we would be more faithful to plant those seeds. Because the truth is, when we share the truth of God, God works. Matthew 11, 12 says the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. Do you believe that the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing in our city? 
in our nation, in our world, in your neighborhood, with your friends and family? Are you praying for that? But that's, listen, that's not the only way that people respond. Uh, once again, the greatest missionary in the world, uh, right, filled with the Holy Spirit, doing all the things, even he received some rejection. Check it out. Verse 44, the next day, the whole, almost the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered together to hear the word of the Lord. Man, I'm praying for that for Bryan College Station, that, the word, that there would be a spiritual revival take place in our city. Verse 44, but the Jews, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge for yourselves, and you judge for yourselves uh, unworthy of eternal life. But we are turning to the Gentiles, so that the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Once again, even Paul the greatest missionary, the greatest church planner, one of the greatest Christians who wrote most of the New Testament is experiencing rejection. He's being contradicted. He's being reviled for sharing the gospel. This is normal. This is the way it works. But I want to show you this. I love this. Verse 48 says, When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing that the gospel was coming to them. They began glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were, were appointed to eternal life believed. Man, that's a great word for us to go, hey, who God has appointed, who God has sovereignly chose to save, He's going to save. We can't mess it up. We can't blow it. We're going to put the word out and God is going to do His work. God is going to do the work of salvation. Praise God for that. And then verse 49, And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But once again, we see some opposition. Verse 50, But the Jews incited devout women of high standing and leading men of the city to stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. And he drove them out of their district. But they shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. Why were they filled with joy? Why were they filled with the Holy Spirit? Because God was at work. And even in the midst of opposition, they're like, listen, God's moving, God's saving. This is supernatural work, and it's happening, it's working. I love this, that even after they've experienced opposition, even after they experienced persecution, they were being reviled, they were being contradicted. Even after all of this, they go, God is at work, and that's what gives us joy. Listen, maybe you've been in a state where you're just kind of living a joyless Christian life. The key to living a joyful Christian life is being obedient to God's commands to go and make disciples of all nations, to share, knowing that some will reject, but some will receive. Some will receive and continue in the grace of God. And that is our hope. That is our prayer for this city, for our nation, and for our world, that the gospel of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ may advance as we declare and demonstrate the gospel to Bryan College Station and beyond. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, for the comfort, for the reminder of your word. Would you empower us with your Holy Spirit? Would you send us? May we hear a word even right now as you say, hey, go to this person or that person or this group. May we be faithful. May we be obedient. May we be provoked in our spirit to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because that and that alone is what gives life. May we believe in it. May we be astonished at your word and may we be faithful to share it so that all may know the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. We love you. We bless you. It's in Jesus name. Amen. Hi church, my name is Christina Brooks and I'm on staff here at Declaration. We are so glad that you came to worship with us today. And before we part ways, I have a couple announcements for you today. First, one of the ways that you can be on mission with us here at Declaration is by giving to the church. First is on our website at declarationchurch.net slash give. The second is on the app called Church Center. Next, it is that time of year again where we start the residency process. If you feel a call to ministry, we would love to have a conversation with you. We are looking for a kids resident, a youth resident, a nation's resident, a neighbor's resident, an admin resident, a college resident, and a worship and production resident. If you would like more information on residency, email info at declarationchurch.net. 
Also, we are having child dedication on December 6th. If you want more information on that, email liz at declarationchurch.net. Thanks again for joining us, church. Now join us in singing the doxology. Father, Son, and Holy